a reading from Psalms. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your promise. My lips will pour forth praise because you teach me your statutes. My tongue will sing of your promise, for all your commandments are right. Let your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let me live that I may praise you, and let your ordinances help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek out your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. A reading from Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called, The Lord is our righteousness. And a reading from Luke. Mary said, His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. The word of the Lord. In scene one, an angel went from God to a town called Nazareth to a woman whose name was Mary. The angel said to her, Rejoice, O highly favored one, for God is with you. You shall bear a child, and his name will be Jesus, the chosen one of God Most High. After the angel informed Mary of how that impossible thing could even happen, Mary said, I am the servant of the Lord, I live to do your will. As a sign of God doing impossible things, the angel also informed Mary that her old and childless kinswoman Elizabeth was expecting her own child, who would be John the Baptist. In scene two, Mary went to the hill country of Judea to visit Elizabeth, and upon her arrival, Elizabeth exclaimed that Mary and her child were both blessed. Elizabeth did not confer a blessing on Mary. Rather, moved by the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth perceived that Mary was blessed because she had believed the angel's message and because of who Mary's baby would be. Mary responded by bursting into song. The scriptures had words from other songs of rejoicing that Mary probably knew. Her own song bears close resemblance to the prayer of Hannah after Hannah delivered the son she had so longed for, Samuel. Samuel anointed the greatest king the kingdom of Israel ever had, David. At first, Mary's song was about her own joy, but then she was able to see from what had personally happened to her what would happen in the world, and her song became a song for all people. It's probably easiest to consider this second stanza of Mary's song by starting at the end. 
The Lord has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. We've already talked about God's promise to David and the Israelites that a descendant of David's would always sit on the throne, which didn't really work out like the people thought it would. The kingdom was destroyed, the temple was destroyed, and the Israelites were taken into exile. Mary looked back farther than David, though, to the father of the Israelites, Abraham. In the 12th chapter of Genesis, God said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. So Abraham went. That promise to Abraham is a major theme in the scripture we know as the Old Testament. Because after God makes the promise with Abraham, the rest of the story of Genesis, and the Old Testament in fact, is about the promise being in jeopardy because of people's actions. And so we hear the stories of Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses. The promise is nearly fulfilled in Moses. The people were liberated. They went to the promised land and they were constituted as a nation with the Sinai covenant in which the law and the commandments were given. Until then, the promise was expressed as being one-sided. God promised to bless Abraham in order that the descendants of Abraham would be a blessing to the world. By the time of the Sinai covenant, God had determined that the Israelites had not realized they had to take some responsibility for the covenant as well. So God gave them the law to teach them how to live in a right relationship with God and with one another and with creation. They immediately blew it, though, by casting a golden calf and worshiping it. And so God sent them back into the wilderness to think about what they had done. And they didn't enter the promised land for another 40 years. That's all recorded in the second book of the Bible, Exodus. The third book of the Bible, Leviticus, adds blessings and curses to the promise and raises the possibility that God might revoke God's promises if the people don't get in line. But Leviticus also raises the possibility that repentance can keep the covenant relationship in place. The story of Abraham is cited as a basis for hope that even when things look impossible, God can still be trusted. In the Psalms, we find some prayers that wonder whether the promises of God have ended. The psalmist answer the questions, though, by remembering. They remember when God had fulfilled God's promises in their history, like in the Exodus, and then their hope was restored. The promises to Abraham were nearly fulfilled again in King David. So God added the promise to David that his descendants would rule forever. Then David committed adultery and murder and the whole nation thing fell apart. Finally, in 587, the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and carried the Israelites into exile. 
Though the people later returned, they were never self-governing again. Some of the prophets thought that the people deserved every disaster they experienced since they had not kept their side of the covenant. But they continued to proclaim that God would keep God's promises because by God's very nature, that's what God does. The prophet still declared, however, that the people were going to have to change in some dramatic ways before the promises would ever be finally fulfilled. So through the prophets, God promised a new covenant, a new promise to be written on the hearts of the people that would be based in God's forgiveness of the people making it possible to achieve the necessary personal and communal changes. When that happened, whenever that happened, there would be no more war, no more hunger, no more illness, and the people would live forever in a right relationship with God, with one another, and with all creation. A major theme of the New Testament is that in Jesus, God fulfilled all the promises made in the Old Testament. We know the words of that new covenant was made in Jesus' blood for the forgiveness of sin for all people. The last book of the Bible, Revelation, describes that the fulfillment of the promises through Jesus Christ will produce a new Jerusalem and that Jesus himself will be the new temple. The old things will pass away and there will be no more grief or crying or pain and Jesus will reign in God's kingdom forever and ever. Mary covered all of that in the second stanza of her song. God's mercy, God's strength, the fall of the proud, and the uplifting of the lowly, the end of hunger, and the equity of wealth, all according to the promises God made to her ancestors forever. Amen.